Another book on this topic is by a couple of Australians and it was published last year, I believe, and it's called A Fortunate Universe. It's by Luke Barnes and Geraint Lewis. And Luke Barnes is at the University of Western Sydney. Geraint Lewis is at the University of Sydney. And they wrote this fantastic book as well. And it traverses all of these issues about fine tuning. The way that Luke likes to put things is to consider if you had a safe and the safe had a whole number of dials that you need to twiddle in order to gain access to the safe. We don't really know what all the constants in nature are. I've seen a number like 26. So, so let's go with 26. If there were 26 dials on this safe and someone broke into the safe, what would be the explanation of how they got in? One possibility is that it could be pure coincidence. They've fiddled with the dials and they've managed to pick the correct number on every single one of those 26 dials. That would be a terribly bad explanation. That is not what the police would assume if someone had broken into the safe. They'd assume they already had knowledge of what the numbers on the dials should be. And so that seems to be the situation in which we find ourselves. Of course, one objection to the safe analogy might be, for example, that there could be many, 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 many different combinations that give you access to the safe. We don't know what all the different combinations of constants of nature there are in order to gain a bio-friendly universe. Some of these constants of nature, by the way, include things not only like the gravitational constant, but other things like the mass of an electron, or the mass of a quark, or the charge on an electron. This thing called the fine structure constant, which determines the strength of the electromagnetic force. So, so how closely, for example, electrons orbit nuclei around atoms. These things determine the formation of molecules. These things determine whether or not DNA can form and self-replicating molecules and ultimately life. So it seems like we have a problem. Now, not everyone thinks that we have a problem. The late Victor Stenger, who was a particle physicist, wrote a, a bunch of books on this, bunch of papers, gave a bunch of talks. Just prior to when he died in uh, 2014, I think, I actually wrote to Victor Stenger because I was writing a project myself. I was finishing my master's in, in astronomy and so I wrote to Victor Stenger because he was about to publish a book. He hadn't published it yet and so I really needed the information for the project that I had. His book was called The Fallacy of Fine Tuning and it was coming out at the time so I thought I, I need to get a hold of this book. I was very grateful he actually sent me a copy of the book before it was published. So with Stenger the hint is in the title of the book The Fallacy of Fine Tuning and he doesn't buy it. He doesn't buy this idea that there's any special mystery to be solved here. I disagree with him, but he basically thinks that there's just a lack of knowledge that we've got here. One example he uses, which isn't one that these days is brought up very often, but there's a related issue, I suppose. The great Fred Hoyle, who was the astrophysicist to whom we owe much credit for explaining the origin of all the elements. Stellar nucleosynthesis is what he explained. So how it is that the elements are forged inside of the cores of stars. He had a problem. One of the problems was in trying to explain early on how different nuclear reactions happen, different fusion reactions happen inside of stars. We had great difficulty in trying to figure out how carbon was formed. The way in which carbon is formed is through a process called the triple alpha process. So what you need in order to create a carbon nucleus is three alpha particles, three helium nuclei. A helium nucleus has two protons, whereas a carbon nucleus has got six protons. So you need three of them to crash into each other in order to form this carbon nucleus. The problem is that if you take three helium nuclei, each of those helium nuclei having two protons has got a charge of two plus and positive charges repel one another. And so when you try and get three of them together, they don't want to go together. So you need exceedingly high energy. So it's, it's an exceedingly unlikely event to occur to get three objects, all of which have positive charges, to combine and to stick together. That's what you need for fusion. So Hoyle had a problem here, thinking that that was just too unlikely he'd done the calculations. As it turns out, the mathematics shows that this particular event is exceedingly unlikely to occur. So they had a workaround and they figured out that if you take two helium nuclei, you can form a nucleus of beryllium. And then if the beryllium collides with another helium nucleus, then you can get carbon. But they found that even this was too unlikely because the beryllium nucleus lasts for a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a second, too short in order to form the carbon that was required. Unless, 
and Hoyle predicted this, unless the carbon nucleus thus formed was of high energy, had a particularly high energy, it's called a resonant state. So he predicted that this resonant state would exist, but this resonant state itself was exceedingly unlikely. It happened at extremely precise, it happens at a particular energy. This appeared to be suspiciously finely tuned. If the carbon nucleus formed from the collision of these two helium together to form the beryllium, and then having a third helium nucleus combined with the beryllium, if the carbon nucleus thus formed didn't have precisely this energy, then you wouldn't end up with carbon at all. And so this seemed to be a mystery. And so this is called the Hoyle resonance. He kind of solved the problem in one respect, namely, this is how carbon is formed, but in the other, raised a problem, namely, why should this energy be so precise? Why should it be at that particular level? Why couldn't you form carbon at any level? And I bought this for a while. I read this both in The Mind of God by Paul Davies and then later on in The Goldilocks Enigma. But in doing research for the project I undertook, I then found a paper by another astrophysicist called Mario Livio. And Mario Livio calculated that the Hoyle resonance wasn't so precise after all. That if you try to create carbon at energy slightly different, then you will indeed get carbon. In fact, you will get the same amount of carbon in our universe if the Hoyle resonance was ever so slightly different to what it actually is in our universe. So what Mario Livio found was that you could fiddle with this very precise value for the Hoyle resonance by a small amount and still get the same amount of carbon being produced in our universe inside the core of stars as what you, well you, as what you actually do see in our universe. So if you change the Hoyle resonance, you'd still get carbon. Indeed, you can change the value of the resonant state of this carbon nucleus by quite a bit and still end up with sufficient carbon in the universe for life to appear. And so this is one of the arguments that Stenger points to and says that, well, maybe all of the fine tuning type problems will turn out to be like this, that if you vary the constants one after another, you will end up nonetheless producing bio-friendly laws. So he's not particularly impressed by it. Of course, my purpose here isn't to uh, go through all the surrounding literature on the fine tuning argument. I'll, I'll provide a link to um, the paper that, that I wrote. In fact, I might even re read that paper at some point, which does provide an overview of the, the broad issues. But I'd encourage people to get uh, A Fortunate Universe is a great book about this fine tuning problem. And it's a great book because the two physicists that have written it have come from quite different places. They both agree it's a problem. But on the one hand, possibly the multiverse could explain this. Now, when I say multiverse, I should probably say megaverse, although there's this nomenclature problem. There's this difficulty with terminology. Multiverse, of course, to me, to David Deutsch, to many other people, means the quantum multiverse. And in the quantum multiverse, all the universes obey precisely the same laws of physics. Indeed, it's the laws of physics that tell us that this quantum multiverse must exist. On the other hand, there is a whole bunch of people who use the word multiverse in a completely different sense. To talk about an ensemble of universes, each of which obeys different physical laws. So it would be like a multiverse of multiverses. And so this is why sometimes um, I just refer to it as the megaverse. The megaverse is scientific in some senses, uh, metaphysical in other senses. There's a sense in which it really is scientific now. I've, I've come to convince myself and through some of the work that Luke Barnes has been doing recently on trying to simulate some of these other universes. So we don't have access to these other universes. We don't think the physical access, which kind of relegates these theories to something like string theory. So it's difficult to understand how we can test this experimentally. But there's a, a weak sense in which we can test them experimentally by simulating these universes inside of a virtual reality. At the moment, those simulations are a very low resolution. So whether or not the calculations that are done inside of these supercomputers, modeling other physical laws or sets of physical laws, how robust those calculations are, uh, time will tell. And as time goes on and we get better and better supercomputers, then uh, maybe quantum computers will be able to help with this, by the way. 